following is a production of Temple University Beasley School of Law. Uh, thank you all very much for being here. This is always one of the high points of the academic year when we come together to celebrate the winner of the Frill Scanlon Award. And I was reminded as I was driving to work today and thinking about making this brief introduction about the importance in academic institutions of research, that we think of ourselves very often as being here to teach, and clearly that's an important part of what we do. But if we didn't have academic research, if we didn't stimulate our students to think about what's not happening in our world, if we didn't make people ask questions about how the world could be better, you know, we would just be walking around and we wouldn't be able to fly and we'd be living in caves and we wouldn't have homes and, <laughs> and all mold would have done, would have ruined food and we wouldn't have life-saving antibiotics. And so um, the research aspect of what we do is really important and I want to acknowledge um, Fr Frank Scanlon, an alum from the class of 1950 who endowed this really wonderful award. It's the only award we have here um, to celebrate outstanding faculty research and I'm really delighted to introduce my colleague, Greg Mandel. But before I do that, I have to start by saying, you know, when you get ready to introduce your colleague, who you, I work really closely with Greg. I have the fortune of having him serve as part of the administrative team. So, yeah, I feel like I know him pretty well until you actually go pull his resume. So my first thought is, I don't think the guy is human. If you look at this, <laughs> if you look at this resume, it is unbelievable in ways that I hadn't reminded myself recently, and I can only for you do the highlights. And then I also wanted to start by saying I'm sorry, because I like Greg Greg a lot. You know, I'm asking him questions and he's always around and always helpful, and I honestly don't know how you do it. And to the extent I've imposed, um, I will publicly apologize to you. <laughs> Um, so, so let me just tell you a little bit about him. Um, he teaches in the intellectual property area and f with a specialty on um, emerging technologies, a focus on patent law and emerging technologies and nanotechnologies and only barely could I even engage in a conversation with him as to what that means, but I'm very proud of him. But I want to tell you a little bit about Greg. He's a graduate of Stanford Law and afterward, um, many of the people who are his colleagues probably know this, but not all of you, um, had a Ninth Circuit clerkship with your Honorable Jerome Ferris. He, I didn't know this, had spent two years working on NASA's Hubble Space Telescope. So we have to talk about that. Um, he was reprocessing Hubble Space Telescope images. Um, he's got quite a science background. He's got publications that are way too numerous to mention. He's done pr over 100 presentations in a dozen countries, um, including in front of the UN and other most famous and notable entities. As I said, he um, serves as an associate dean for which I am internally grateful. He is our research dean here at Temple Law School. And his resume is full of all manner of community and university service. But in addition to all of this, and I mean, there's just so much professional achievement there. Um, he's also really cool. So he has climbed to the highest point in 36 states, um, which he started with his dad, who's here with us. And I thought that was really nice, and I think is continuing with Isaac. And I, I thought that was a really nice legacy to hand down. Um, he has visited, he told me just this week in passing, all but two states. So I'm seeing travel ahead. Um, He's also a birder, and he has a list of birds that he is seeking to see and scratching them off one at a time, and I think that's interesting, and I don't know anybody else that does that. So um, I just want to congratulate you, Greg, on all that you've accomplished um, and for all that you do for this institution. I want to congratulate you on being this year's winner of the Friel Scanlon Award, and I'm looking forward to hearing about the psychology of intellectual property, so please join me in welcoming my colleague and my friend, Greg Mandel. here um, because it's lot, lots of my faculty colleagues and other folks who I get to work with. You really make this 
uh, it makes it a pleasure to come to work. It is the best job in the world. Uh, we try to keep that secret. We don't want too many other people to know, but it's wonderful. Um, I'm glad to see a bunch of students because that sort of excitement and enthusiasm makes teaching here an absolute joy. Uh, it's a lot of fun to have my parents and my mother-in-law and uh, my kids. Uh, Isaac has promised that he's going to make me laugh during this presentation, <laughs> so he's, he's going to do his best. Uh, but they're going to have to like, sit here and listen to me without interrupting for probably the longest period of their lives. <laughs> um, but especially, most of all, Allison, um, who I rarely get to thank publicly for all of her support and patience and encouragement, which I really appreciate. Uh, and realizing how long I've been teaching, I've been teaching now. She's been wonderful, um, and in fact, may have been the reason that I'm writing and researching about this stuff, um, because I never did anything related to psychology in school. Um, but then uh, I met and got engaged and got married to Allison while she was getting her PhD in social psychology. So uh, if you ask, how can I do this kind of stuff? It's it's because of it's because of her. Um, so, right, that's a good segue. <laughs> the psychology of intellectual property. Um, how do we get there? To begin with, right, IP is a sort of unusual field. And a lot of you have probably been thinking that for a while. So <laughs> you have mentioned that to me. Um, but one way in which it's particular is that there's actually a remarkable degree of consensus about the ends of intellectual property law. So policymakers, uh, scholars, commentators, all generally agree that the goal of intellectual property law is to provide these incentives so that we get more creation, more innovation, more distribution, and commercialization of that innovation. Uh, and this consensus could come from various places. It might come from the constitutional underpinnings of the intellectual property clause, which purposively begins by <coughs> begins to promote the progress. It may come from difficulties with conceptualizing intangible property rights, maybe some other source. But whatever <coughs> the reason, there's not that much debate in the United States about the goals of intellectual property. So some of you are now wondering, OK, if you're right, right what's all this noise I hear about IP? So the vociferous debates you hear in IP these days is not about what the goals of IP law should be, but about how we get there, right? what the means are for achieving it. And we can see the incentivization focus if we look uh, in patent law from the earliest times. Some of you may have heard of this guy, Thomas Jefferson. He's famous for being the first US commissioner of patents. <laughs> and he very uh, famously in the IP schemes, was quite clear that we have intellectual property protection, not because inventors are entitled to any rights in their inventions, but for the social benefit. We provide these incentives for the social benefit. So it's about the incentives, not about any natural rights. And that's true in the current day. Mark Lemley and Dan Burke are two of the leading scholars in IP, and uh, they wrote in just a very heavily cited article and book Theories of patent law based on moral right, reward, or distributive justice, i.e. non-incentive theories, are hard to take seriously. It's a pretty strong statement. I just did a search. I can't find a single source disputing that quote. Um, I can think of one other professor, one other person in the academy who, sort of, who, who very frankly is a contrarian in this regard, and he actually refers to himself as that nutty uncle in the act. <laughs> makes me think a little bit of Jane Eyre or something. Um, we hear, sometimes we hear slightly more diverse views about copyright law, and other countries have moral rights in their copyright code that give authors certain rights, such as rights to attribution, that clearly uh, are more about natural rights or entitlement rather than an incentive theory. Uh, but there's still relatively uniform opinion in the United States. Again, of course there are debates about the appropriate scope and strength of copyright law, but parties on our, all sides generally agree it's about incentives. So I did a fun little experiment for the talk today. I thought to myself, what is the most sort of ultra strong, hard line, pro strong copyrights organization I could think of? And I came up with the Recording Industry Association of America. I went to the website, find their mission statement. What does it say? 
RIAA works to protect intellectual property rights, i.e. strengthen intellectual property rights, in order to promote creation and commercialization. And RIAA has never heard of a copyright like copyright they didn't want to that they didn't like or want to make stronger. So then I thought, okay, who's the most staunchly opposed to this opinion? Right? Who takes the opinion that copyrights should be weaker? Creative Commons. And I go to their website, and literally, this took me like two minutes. You know, it was not selecting organizations. Right? I go to their website, there's a policy statement that says, we have to strengthen users' <laughs> rights and enlarge the public domain, i.e. we have to make copyright law weaker in order to promote creation and commercialization. Exactly the same goals. So we roughly agree about the objectives, but we disagree about how to get there. Try to figure out then what the appropriate level of intellectual property rights is in order to maximize these incentives to innovate, to create, to commercialize is the central objective of IP law. And the work I've done in IP over the last uh, bunch of years now has been focused on these issues from a couple, from a couple different angles. Um, there's an inevitable trade-off when we think about optimizing incentives between the benefits that IP rights provide in the form of the possibility of getting those rights being an incentive versus the costs that IP rights produce by granting rights that limit access to information. And lots of thought and resources and energy has been devoted to this problem of trying to figure out how do we optimize these incentives to it's a really tough nut to crack. In some regards, we ha aren't that far along. I've done some work in this area, very briefly, arguing that innovation and creation is too complex a social and psychological phenomenon in order for us to ever figure out how to balance this relationship directly, but that there may be indirect proxies in the form of certain industries and certain countries with sort of selected characteristics uh, that may provide a proxy for this relationship and we can piggyback off of that and figure some things out and blah blah blah. If you're interested in that, I'm happy to talk about it a lot more, but I'm not going to talk about it today. <laughs> Instead, I'm going to talk about another implication of this central IP focus on the goals of providing incentivization. Since incentives are uh, the objective of intellectual property law, it means that IP law inherently depends on its ability to affect human behavior. So the psychology of IP, by which I mean individuals' perceptions and understandings of, of intellectual property law, becomes a critical component of the ability of the law to achieve its goals. And it's this line of research that I'm going to talk about today. This is also another way in which law is slightly unusual. Um, the law in most other fields, in most fields, can achieve at least some of its objectives, regardless of individuals having an ex ante understanding of the law or an ex ante knowledge of the law. And that's true both in public law and in private law, right? So it's obviously true in public law. In private law, uh, if you think about tort law, right? Tort law can compensate victims. Uh, criminal law can still provide for retribution or incapacitation or rehabilitation, regardless of whether individuals knew about the law beforehand, before the act. For IP law, on the other hand, because of its incentive orientation, it depends on that ex ante understanding of the law in order for it to succeed. It can only incentivize IP producers if they have some understanding or are reacting to the law in some way. So we have this premise that if we provide these rights, it'll induce people to engage in certain behaviors. IP law also depends on perception around IP or the psychology of IP with respect to other aspects. Um, so, for instance, IP law depends significantly on the perception of IP for compliance among many users 
If you think about the advances made by modern technology and the high transaction costs of enforcement, right, you all know that we actually need widespread voluntary compliance with intellectual property law in many regards in order for the system to work well. The perception of the law, of IP law, is also going to affect how jurors and judges decide many IP cases. It's going to affect how lawmakers set or try to set IP law. It's going to affect public discourse and issue framing among the media, uh, the voters, and the general public. But despite the critical importance of human perception and human behavior to the success of IP law, these issues have barely been explored. Let me move from why this matters to my framework for pursuing this work. So I envision the psychology of IP lying at an inflection point between an upstream series of psychological determinants and a downstream set of behavioral activities that the law seeks to induce. There are a variety of input factors, such as you know, social, cultural, environmental, possibly legal uh, influences that affect an individual's understanding or psychology of IP. And this psychology of IP, in turn, likely affects behavioral decisions of about to, whether or not to engage in creative efforts or invest resources uh, in research about whether to observe the intellectual property rights of others or not to observe the intellectual property rights of others. And so understanding these contours, influences, and effects is important for understanding the psychology of IP and whether the law can function as design. Um, and that's what I am looking at here. Now certainly different determinants affect different individuals, right? So the determinants that affect a researcher working in a giant pharmaceutical lab are going to be very different from those that affect an individual artist, author, tinkerer working alone at home. But in all cases, we can apply the same framework. So that's the motivation and the framework on to the study. Um, for the first step of sort of doing some research in this area, I decided to focus on the general public. It's a nice accessible population. <laughs> but it's an important population because, one, it tells us what the perception of a large number of potential IP producers are going to be, specifically a group that is, we can think of as sort of the un IP sophisticated group. This will include lots of individuals. It'll include lots of folks at small companies and startup firms. And we actually have pretty good data indicating that the largest advances are made precisely at small firms and startups. But it will also include right, many IP users, uh, probably many jurors, some judges, probably many legislators. So understanding the general public perception around IP is an important piece of understanding a lot of actors in this field. My study that I'm about to tell you about uses a series of IP scenario experiments in order to investigate four primary research questions. Uh, see them up there. First is whether and how public perceptions of IP can work the law. Second is whether and how public perceptions of IP vary across different types of creativity. So does it vary depending on whether you're talking about artistic or inventive creativity? Third, how does the popular basis for intellectual property rights compare to the common rationales, the standard rationales applied in policy and legal decision making? And then finally, see if we can understand what factors influence, it, influence opinions about intellectual property rights. Um, the National Science Foundation grant I have is to dive further into this research. So this is what, it, what it's about. It's about exploring this area much more, um, asking additional questions, looking at different populations, exploring cross-culturally between the U.S. and China. So what I did was develop four paired intellectual property scenarios and gave them to a national pop audience, national participant audience of over 1,700 adults in the United States online via SurveyMonkey. And each scenario 
involve a creator, their creative product, potential IP rights in that product, in two different conditions. One condition involves artistic creation, so it tells a story of somebody who creates uh, some authorial work, such as a new book, or a sculpture, or a song. And then the second condition is worded nearly identically, except it involves an inventive creation, so the production of a medical device, or a mechanical invention, um, or software, or computer, computer software. I use the between subjects design, each subject receives one condition for each of the four different kinds of scenarios, randomly ordered or assigned, and then I query the subjects concerning whether they believe that the creator should be entitled to IP rights in these particular circumstances. I'll tell them a little bit about what those rights would entail. And I also ask them about their basis for awarding or not awarding such rights, and that's answered, answered on a multiple choice selection with options for uh, natural rights, uh, or entitlement basis, incentive basis, uh, an expressive basis, again, there are explanations for those, and an opportunity to put in their own choice or other as well. So that's the setup on who some results. Uh, the four different <laughs> scenarios, bless you, four different types of scenarios looked at four different areas of IP. These are all core IP doctrine and issues. First is an infringement scenario that's given, provides infringement for infringement in an online context. The second is a creativity threshold scenario, that is how creative uh, do you think the innovation needs to be in order to deserve IP protection. In each case that involves a new and original but obvious development. The third scenario involves the later independent creation of a similar uh, creative work, and in the final scenario, tested one with joint creators, whether a roughly 20% contributor to a work should be entitled to share in a IP rights. So, first research question, as you all recall, was about whether and how public perceptions of IP rights accord with the actual law, and what we learn is not so much. <laughs> um, these cells, each cell shows the percentage of participants who thought that the creator should be entitled to IP rights in that given context, in the particular scenario and condition. If participants had answered according to actual law, then you would see 100% of participants uh, awarding rights in any cell where the law gives IP rights and 0% of participants awarding rights in a cell where there are no IP rights. If you look at the copyright conditions first, what you see is that for uh, only one of the three scenarios did more than about 60% of participant responses accord with the actual law. That was the creativity threshold scenario. In the other three involving infringement, independent creation, joint creation, um, sort of a bare majority, a small majority of participants accorded with the law. The results were even more disparate in the patent context. Here, in three of the four scenarios, the majority of participant responses were contrary to the actual law. Okay, and again, these are sort of core basic IP issues, right? I'm not testing uh, too obscure nuances uh, yet. We'll see if David or Don calls me. But I think these are, these, are pretty, these are pretty core areas of, of IP law. Um, obviously, this is problematic. So first, it's problematic for the whole incentive theory of IP. If folks disagree with the law, then you can't get the behavioral effect that we desire in many circumstances, and so we have a problem with the effectiveness of the law. Obviously, it's also really problematic from a legitimacy perspective. If we have sort of, if you average it out, just barely over half of the people, half of people agree with aspects of IP law, then the public will tend to view the, the law as illegitimate, and that maybe creates sort of downward spiral or cycle with regard to effectiveness. So it's problematic. Um, it's worth noting that the effects, the relationship between public perception and the law was not consistent. Sometimes the public wanted stronger IP law than the law provided, sometimes weaker law than the law provided. Sometimes, uh, as I said, and I was being generous, um, the, one, the, the sort of responses were similar to what the law provided. Okay, so that's the first question. Turning second to the question of do people think about copyright versus patent differently? 
What we see here is that there was a statistically significant difference between the results of the patent condition and the copyright condition. So under basically the same frame, framing, people view the question of whether IP rights should be granted differently based on whether the creation was artistic or inventive. That said, I think this is actually a bit of a red herring, but the statistical significance is a bit of a red herring caused by the large study size. And so this may be the only time you hear a researcher say, I got a statistically significant result, but I don't think that's the story. I think the bigger story here is actually the correlation, the close correlation between the patent and copyright results. So the largest difference we see is in the creativity threshold, where 75% of folks in the copyright condition thought rights should be provided, but only 60% of folks in the patent condition thought there should be uh, rights should be provided, right? The difference of 15%, we get to do math. Okay. But if participants had answered according to actual law, then 100% of folks in the copyright condition and 0% of folks in the patent condition would have answered that rights should be granted. In the independent creator and joint creator scenarios, we have only a 5% difference in participant responses despite the fact that the law is entirely opposite. And then the fourth scenario, it's an 11% difference. So participant responses are really pretty close here considering how varied the actual law is. Bringing together uh, these sort of results on the first two research questions, right, there are multiple possible explanations for what's going on here. It could be that the public has a greater knowledge of actual copyright law. Like maybe you've all been paying attention to those screaming big clips at the beginning of the tapes you rent or something. Um, and a belief about is affects a belief about ought. Or it may be that the public perception has actually had a greater influence on copyright law. We certainly have pretty good evidence um, that legislators for many decades have been more comfortable dealing with copyright law than that sort of wacky cop wacky patent stuff that involves technology that we let folks do in a back room. In either case, maybe there's a presumption that since we don't know about patent law, patent and copyright are similar. Um, and interesting questions, important questions, stuff I need, you know, this study doesn't answer, uh, but it's part of what I'm going to look at more in the future. Third research question, also look at the basis for IP rights. So what did I talk about, I, right, I set up my talk by talking about this whole incentive basis for IP rights. Okay, great. What do people commonly think about it? And what we find is that the public largely perceives a natural rights basis for intellectual property law, both patent and copyright, uh, more than either an incentive basis or even other alternatives like an expressive basis. In every condition, every scenario, more participants select a natural rights basis than either of the other alternatives, generally by a wide differential. Um, this result again raises more problems for, it runs counter to and raises more problems for the dominant incentive based theory of IP law because if people don't agree with the basis it's unlikely that they're going to respond to those incentives in the way desired. This result may explain some of the differences we just saw beforehand in certain regards, right? A different perception of the basis may affect why we're seeing different uh, preferences with respect to the law. But either way, it means that the IP system can't function as designed for a lot of the un-IP educated population, uh, either with respect to IP production or compliance or decision making. Finally, I combined individuals' results across multiple scenarios to create an IP strength Likert scale and tested the relationship between a bunch of predictor variables or possible independent predictor variables and an individual's likelihood to support stronger or weaker IP rights. And we can look at, or I should say, I guess first, where we can see specific significance. So what we find is that being older, having lower income, being more educated, having less experience with IP, all correlate with the desire for stronger intellectual property rights. And I think it may be a little bit easier if we look at the scope of these differentials graphically. Uh, 
Being older isn't too surprising. There's not, there's not much data in this area, but one of the few things there are are surveys about attitudes towards IP on the internet, and those also find that younger people prefer weaker IP rights. Having lower income seems a little more surprising to me, um, but maybe it stems from a desire to upset the status quo, uh, iconic view of the ability for an individual creator to strike it rich with creative achievement. People being more educated or knowing more experience with IP, preferring weaker rights, may seem counterintuitive at first. But those with more experience learn that incentive theory of IP that I've been discussing, and people who perceive an incentive basis for IP uh, prefer weaker rights. These are all looking at the population as a whole. I ran additional re regressions looking at parts of the study population, so I might look at responses in copyright versus patent or other, or other groups. Um, additional results there. Uh, conservatives prefer stronger patent protection to liberals, but there's no difference in copyright protection. Women and minorities prefer stronger IP rights in certain conditions. Not for the population as a whole, it's not a statistically significant result, but in certain conditions it is. And then I'm still turning up uh, new stuff when, when I get a freight from all those questions you, you, you asked me. Um, I just found, uh, so, so this week, I, I, this literally, or in the last two weeks, I've literally sort of just turned up this stuff that I'm still uh, sort of working through and trying to think about. Um, so some interactive effects. If you're a woman, then employment makes you like stronger IP rights. If you're a man, employment makes you like weaker IP rights. So employment has an effect on everyone, but varies by gender. Um, another employment one. If you are employed, then your level of education does not affect your preference for the strength of IP rights. But if you're unemployed, it has a strong effect. So employment is interacting with preferences for IP rights in significant ways, but not consistently, and it varies based on these other independent characteristics. And so that's something I want to explore more and try to figure out what, what, what might be going on. Um, so that's basically it. Sort of in conclusion, what I'll just say is I think this last, this last suite of findings I've been discussing are important with respect to IP issues. If you, there's actually more rounds of copyright reform and patent reform pending in Congress now. We've got a bunch of pending U.S. Supreme Court decisions. Uh, we got to hear there are a lot of international IP issues going on. Uh, faculty got to hear about a bunch at lunch in IP day. Uh, so I think it's wonderful, but I appreciate your patience. Um, so, but but the, the, this, this variety of findings I think is important because they indicate that there are these cultural divides over IP that actually haven't previously been identified, but are likely to affect the discourse and the outcome of the future IP debates. Thank you all very much.